Science-based lifting is when you base your workouts around what the science says is best for muscle growth. It's a relatively new style of training, the opposite of the more old school shut up and lift approach. Science-based lifters do optimized exercises, track their weights, and instead of always pushing their muscles as hard as possible, they push themselves in a more controlled way, hard enough to maximize the muscle stimulus, but not so hard that you create too much fatigue. This is basically how I've trained for the last 10 years, but this style of training is clearly under attack. The big channels now are all about the science-based. I'm really tired of the whole science-based training movement. I don't think science-based lifting is good and I don't think it's a good idea. I'll be honest, I find these criticisms a little frustrating, but not for the reasons that you might think. You see, when you search science-based workout on YouTube, I'm the first result. If you search optimal training on TikTok, it's me again. So you might think these critiques frustrate me because an attack on science-based lifting is basically an attack on me, but that's not why. The real reason that I find these critiques frustrating is that they're not entirely wrong. I actually agree with some of the critiques about science-based lifting. So in this video, I wanna set the record straight. I'm gonna show you all the things everyone thinks are science-based that I actually disagree with. And then I'm gonna show you the few things that are truly science-based and that I do agree with. And by the end of the video, you'll know exactly which aspects of science-based lifting you need to pay attention to and which aspects you can ignore. All right, let's start with the most popular science-based lifting advice that slow negatives are better for muscle growth. Anytime I hear anyone talk about science-based lifting, the first thing I hear is that you need to slow down the negative, that part of the lift where you're lowering the weight back down. But do slow negatives actually build more muscle? Well, let's see. This study had people train their biceps with preacher curls for seven weeks. One group did a normal one second negative. The other group did a slow four second negative. After seven weeks, both groups grew the same amount of muscle. This study had people do squats with either a two second negative or a slow four second negative. Both groups grew the same amount of muscle. And this study had people do leg extensions one leg at a time. One leg used a normal one second negative the other leg used a slow three second negative. Both legs grew the same. That's three studies showing that a normal one to two second negative works just as well as a slower three to four second negative. Now, some of you may object that Mike Isratel preaches slow negatives and he's an expert. Control slow, 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 slow. And yes, Mike is an expert and I value his opinion. So I wanted to give him a call and ask him why. So Mike, uh, Based on the workouts we've had together, I've gathered that you like to use slower negatives. Could you explain your rationale behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. There are a few layers of rationale. It's a little bit nuanced. And so sometimes I think I get understandably kind of interpreted by other people as like just carte blanche advocating slow negatives. A lot of people will assume that I think there's a direct hypertrophy benefit to them. And I don't think that, but there are some good reasons to use a slower negative. I can tell you like, okay, slowing down your negative doesn't directly cause any more muscle growth, but it's substantially safer. All of a sudden it's like, okay, so there's no downside really, but there's an upside of safety. Like, okay, that sounds pretty cool. That sounds like an interesting thing to really think about. The other thing is a lot of people have trouble with a mind muscle connection. They can't feel their pecs working, their biceps working, whatever their muscle their group they're doing. It's a, it's a situation. And the mind muscle connection does not produce these crazy differences in hypertrophy. But in some individuals, it can produce substantial differences, small but notable ones, and that can help. Just out of curiosity, like in your own training, how long would you say each negative takes you on average? <laughs> two seconds, maybe? Really? One okay. to two seconds. That's, yeah. Really? Okay, like, that's not yeah. that slow though. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's not. It's just enough to control the load and enough for me to feel pr pretty safe. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're actually, there's not as much space between us as I as I thought on that. Um, I think in our workouts, you probably instructed me to slow down because I'm, yes. I'm, I am new to a lot of the techniques that you guys yes. use. So I think those are great reasons to use slower negatives. And Mike and I are actually more alike on this than I realized. Even though slowing down the negative can help you lock in your technique better, for sure, I think we'd both agree that controlling the negative is the most important thing. It doesn't necessarily need to be super slow. This year, I was an author on a scientific review of optimal lifting technique, and we found that as long as each rep lasts two to eight seconds in total, you're good. So here's what you need to know. If your negatives last less than one second, they're too fast. You should slow them down and control the weight better. If your negatives last one to seven seconds or so, you're in the sweet spot. 
In this zone, I think it's up to your personal preference how slow you go. But if your negatives last eight seconds or longer, they're probably too slow and you'd be better off speeding them up a bit. So I'm not quitting on slow negatives altogether, but I am quitting the idea that you need to go really slow to maximize hypertrophy. Another very popular science-based trend involves technique tips and tweaks. The idea here is that you modify exercises in a specific science-based way and you'll build more muscle. I use some of these little tips and tweaks myself, like setting the seat back on leg extensions, staying in the stretched half on calf raises, and raising the cable height on lateral raises. But it goes well beyond that. You cannot open social media without being flooded with a new spin on a common exercise. So the question is, are these tips and tweaks actually science-based? And how much of a difference do they actually make? Well, I think it depends on the specific tip in question. Some of these tips do work and are based on some direct peer-reviewed evidence. Some of them might work, but are based on more indirect evidence. And some probably don't work at all, or at least aren't based on any science. So to make this as clear as possible, I made this table. I took every cue I could find on social media and put them into one of three categories. Cues that work and are based on science, cues that might work and are based on indirect science, and cues that probably don't work or at least don't have any science behind them. I included the scientific reference for cues that have one, and I'll highlight all the cues that I actually do myself in blue so you can pause and screenshot if you wanna read. But the reality is all of these tips and tweaks, every one of them, even the science-based ones, will have a relatively minor impact on your gains. And none of these tips and tweaks are as important as simply pushing yourself hard and doing enough volume. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because it's not just tips and tweaks that people associate with science-based lifting. Science-based lifting has become synonymous with perfect technique in general. Let me prove that to you. Which of these two techniques looks more science-based to you? I'm doing perfect, strict technique on the left, and Sam is doing loose, cheating technique on the right. Most people would say that my technique is more science-based, but why? As of now, there's never been a study comparing strict technique to loose technique. Future science could show that loose cheat reps actually cause more growth than perfect strict reps. We don't know. And until that study comes out, it'd be misleading to say that perfect strict form is more science-based. Luckily, we won't have to wait very long for that study because I'm helping run it now at Lehman College in New York. Now, of course, when you do any exercise, there are a few basic technique guidelines that you should follow so you can do the exercise safely and effectively. For example, on a squat, you don't wanna fall backward or fall forward, so you should try to keep the bar in line with the middle of your foot. You should try to keep a relatively neutral spine, although a little butt wink at the bottom isn't worth freaking out about, and you should get as deep as you comfortably can because squatting deep does seem to cause more quad growth and glute growth. But the exact angle you point your toes in, the specific stance width you take, and whether you put your thumb on top or bottom will, in all likelihood, have a very small impact on your gains. These things can help you feel more comfortable with the lift, but the reality is, if you're in the gym squatting with a high effort each week, your legs are going to grow. The same goes for the lat pulldown. Many science-based lifters think that if they just take the perfect grip width and point their elbows in exactly the right direction, they're gonna unlock a whole new level of gains. Probably not. Grab the bar, lock yourself into the seat, pull the bar down to your chest, control the weight on the way up, and push the set hard. If you do that, your back is going to grow. And technique refinements beyond that are ultimately just guesses. I personally don't have a problem with people making those guesses, especially if they're educated guesses. There's nothing wrong with telling someone to take a closer grip to target their lats from a different angle, or to lean back a bit more to target the mid-back. But if we're being real, pretty much all of training technique is so much more of an art than it is a science, at least for now. But coaching should be a blend of science and experience, so that's okay but there's an element of perfect technique that isn't okay. And it's this unrealistic expectation that there should never be any change in your technique from your first rep to your last rep. Let's say on rep one, you get the bar all the way down to your chest. By the time you get to rep 10, you can't quite get the bar all the way down. It's about one inch away. That means rep 10 looks a little different from rep one. So as a science-based lifter, you end the set there. But if you do that, you're leaving quite a few reps in the tank. In my opinion, just because the range of motion was one inch less doesn't mean you need to terminate the set. That's why I love Sam Solik's style of lat pulldowns where he keeps going even after he can't complete a full rep. When you're pushing really hard, some of your reps might look a little ugly. In my book, that's totally fine, but I do think you should still keep your form somewhat consistent from week to week for tracking progress. If your technique gets sloppier and sloppier over time, you'll still make gains, but you're probably not progressing the target muscle as much as you think. Now, out of everything, science-based lifting is most famous for optimal exercises. Optimal exercises claim to be better for muscle growth based on scientific studies. 
But what are those studies exactly? Well, let's see by comparing two very different back exercises the half kneeling one arm cable lat pull down and the bent over barbell row. Most people think of the one arm cable lat pull down as the more science based exercise and the barbell row as the more hardcore exercise. Maybe that's understandable. After all, in my back tier list video, I put the one arm half kneeling lat pull down in S tier and the barbell row in B tier. And that led to reactions like this one. That's S tier! That's S tier! That is not S tier. That reaction kind of makes sense, honestly, because the way I ranked these exercises, many people understandably thought that I think you'd build a bigger back with the one arm cable pull down than with the barbell row. But I don't think that, and I didn't think that when I made the tier list video. If you were forced to do just one of these exercises for the rest of your life, I would 100% pick the barbell row. That's because it's a compound movement that'll activate all the muscles in your back. By contrast, the one-arm lat pulldown will specifically isolate one muscle in your back, your lats. These are different tools for different jobs. I'd pick the barbell row if I was training someone limited on time and who needed to get the most bang for their buck. I'd especially pick it if they were trying to get stronger. But I'd pick the one-arm lat pulldown for someone who's already hit their basic compound lift and needed a little extra volume for their lagging lats. That one-arm lat pull will add more lat volume for basically no fatigue. It's perfect for that. The reason I put the barbell row in B tier is because I think there's a better tool for the same job. The deficit pendlay row does the same job as the barbell row, plus a bigger stretch and a more standardized range of motion. And a chest supported machine row does the same job as the barbell row, but with more stability and less fatigue. In retrospect, I just wasn't clear enough on what the tiers meant. So a lot of people thought that the S tier exercises were the most science-based exercises, A tier exercises were a little less science-based, and B tier and below were basically just bro science. That's not true though. There's honestly just not much science on exercise selection at all. It may shock you to learn that there's never been a single study that has measured back muscle hypertrophy directly. Not one. There's just biomechanics research and EMG studies. And we don't even know if EMG predicts hypertrophy. So my tier list rankings mainly came from indirect evidence and personal experience. And now having done the series, I think it'd be more accurate to think of the tier list as going from slightly more effective to slightly less effective. But you need to realize that as long as you take any exercise to failure or close to failure, that exercise will build muscle. From there, you can fine tune things based on stretch, tension, overload, and what feels good. But I do think the exact exercises you pick are less important than simply training hard and doing enough volume. Training hard and doing enough volume is what hypertrophy science is really all about. I mean, just look at all the hypertrophy studies on training volume alone and compare that to all the hypertrophy studies on the optimal bench angle for pec growth. So I'm gonna go a little deeper on these two topics, training hard and doing enough volume. When it comes to training hard, this is what the science shows. The latest meta-analysis took 15 studies, pulled them together and compared the muscle growth from groups going to failure versus groups not going to failure. And this graph shows their overall findings. As you can see, as you get closer and closer to failure, you do get more muscle growth. But there's a point where too much failure training can cause recovery issues. I think as long as you're getting one to three reps shy of failure, you're good. But the problem is, if you always leave three reps in the tank, you might accidentally be leaving five or six reps in the tank without realizing it. That underexertion will cost you gains. So I like to play it a little safe and get a little closer to failure than I probably need to. I usually leave one or two reps in the tank on most sets and then push my last set all the way to failure, assuming it's an exercise I can fail safely on. How hard you push is your training quality. How many sets you do is your training quantity. You need both quality and quantity for maximum gains. So for maximum gains, how many sets should you do? Well, in the research, this is called training volume, and it's the number of hard sets you do per muscle per week. For example, if you do five sets for your chest per week, you do low volume training. If you do 10 sets for your chest per week, you do moderate volume training. And if you do 20 plus sets for your chest per week, you do high volume training. I'd call 30 plus sets per muscle per week, ultra high volume training. And luckily, we now understand the relationship between volume and muscle growth so much better than ever before. A brand new training volume meta-analysis was just published a few weeks ago with a ton of super impressive data analysis. Across 35 studies, they found that doing more volume did in fact cause more muscle growth. And that was true all the way up to 42 sets per muscle per week. That's an insanely high, borderline impractically high level of volume, and the gains are diminishing. But it's nonetheless true that the more work you do, the better gains you get, at least in the short term. And that's the crucial caveat with this research. 
it's still unclear how these different volumes play out over the long term. That's because most of these studies only last six to 10 weeks. So for six to 10 weeks or so, yeah, doing high volume causes more gains, but we don't know for sure if that's true over time. For that reason, I think the volume sweet spot is still in this range for most people, eight to 20 sets per muscle per week. If you really wanna bring up a lagging body part, like your chest, for example, you could blast it with super high volume for a month or two, going as high as 30 sets per week. And as long as you reduce your volume for other body parts, you should recover fine and make some sweet pec gains. But remember, if you don't have all day to train, the research still shows that even just four sets per muscle per week can get the job done as long as you push those sets hard. And if you take one message away from this video, I hope it's that your training doesn't need to be perfect to be effective. I know some people in my audience get paralysis by analysis. They wanna figure out every little thing about training before getting to work. I think it's cool to try to figure out every little thing. I do that myself. But the reality is the best program isn't always the most optimal one. It's the one you'll actually stick to. So it's totally fine if you drop your strict RPE adherence and do some feel-based sets every now and then. It's also totally fine if you do some workouts that are suboptimal on paper, but just more fun in the gym. It's cool if you do some cheat reps at the end of some sets because it helps you get in the zone. None of these things are in conflict with smart training because smart training is mostly about training hard and being consistent. I start my new book, The Muscle Ladder, with a chapter on sustainability, and then there's a big chapter on mindset. These two principles form the rails of the ladder, and then all the other variables like technique, exercise selection, effort, and volume make up the 10 rungs of the ladder. It's a huge hardcover book with super high quality print, full color images, and diagrams, plus 20 training programs. So I'll link it in the description box down below. I also wanna quickly mention that my nutrition app, Macro Factor, is doing a massive $100,000 transformation contest starting January 1st. To enter, all you need to do is download Macro Factor and enter the contest through the link below. The person with the best transformation will win $50,000 and then 100 other people will also win a $500 cash prize. It's a huge opportunity to not only transform your physique in the new year, but also have a pretty good shot at winning some cash. So I'll link that in the description box as well. All right, that's it for this one, guys. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all here in the next one.